real honest with you here. So you can take my stories, maybe they make sense for you and help you out in your journey forward in music, or maybe they don't. We're all kind of different and we come from different places and we're headed to different places. But one of the things was Michael was my classical teacher when I first showed up. And the first lesson was, well, you're gonna have to sit a certain way and you know, with your leg up, the guitar over on your left knee, and you have to start growing your fingernails. And I'm like, that's, you know, you're kidding me, you know, all these things, you know, and it was just like, so I kind of fought it for a while, and um, then I finally got with it, and I was like, you know what, I'm here, let's just get on with this and do it, so um, I gotta say, I'm, I wanna say now so that I don't forget, Michael kicked my ass here, and it was a beautiful thing, because it, I, I kind of came in as this guy who knew a bunch of Jimi Hendrix tunes, and uh, Rush, and I love Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. Really didn't know what to do. And to get the point across again, millions of great rock guitar players in the world. Uh, no problem to find them. To find a really good rock player who can also really play jazz well, who can also pick up a nylon string guitar and play that well too, is much more rare. So in the studios out there, when they hire you and you go in to do a session, if you're the guy who can do all those things, they love you because they only have to hire one guy instead of three. You know, everybody practices, right? And, I, and we talk to all the guys behind me too, as time goes on, you get less and less time to practice. So you think you don't have much time now, you're just gonna start getting more and more responsibilities and uh, it becomes harder and harder to get that time. So you have to make your practice time really count. So one of the big things is before you sit down to practice, you kinda need a goal. And be realistic, it's like, okay, I have a half hour right now. I'm going to, whatever, let's get better at sight reading. I'm gonna spend this whole half hour on reading. And that's the big thing, if you're gonna practice, don't just sit down and start like, you know, whatever instrument you're playing, pull it out and start jamming because if it's an hour time you had, you just realize you jammed sort of for 45 minutes and you didn't really move yourself ahead.
When I moved from here, I went out to USC. I, I uh, ended up getting my master's there, and that was my kind of way to go to another city and have a way in. I wasn't just going to drive out there with a guitar on my back and start hitting the jam sessions. That's, that would have been insane. Some people can do it and make that happen, but I needed a little more of something to go to, a comfort zone. So um, LA is just route with uh, pit holes, there's snakes, there's rattlesnakes everywhere, and I'm talking about people here, in case you, and there's sharks, and uh, you have to figure it out, man, you have to figure out how to navigate it, because you understand a lot of people move from their, they're the hot shot in their small town out, and they move out there, and they, uh, you know, they're gonna make it at all costs, and it's like, if you get in their way, they're like, hey man, I love you, you're a cool guy, but this is my shot, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stomp on you right now. Four up front. A one, two, a one. <laughs> On this bullet board, there was something um, uh, uh, looking for bands to play at a supermarket. So I'll go through this fast. So I just called it. The guy uh, um, showed up. It was out near the beach. Uh, got a, a music group together. Um, and I knew a bunch of guys. There was a band called the Rippingtons and all. I hired their drummer. There was enough money in the budget. So I went out. Did this gig and just kept doing it. They loved the band, so we did it for like three months through the summer or whatever on Sunday afternoons playing out at this uh, uh, mall near the beach. So it wasn't like the world's coolest gig, but like I said, it was paying enough that I could get great musicians, so I was sort of networking that way. Okay, the guy who hired me ended up, he had a recording studio. 
So he heard my playing, loved my playing. Hey, come in, would you record some stuff on me? I need some guitar on it. So I ended up doing that, and that was all cool, so I kept getting called back to that studio. Another producer came in, uh, and he liked what I was doing, so I started working with him, did a whole bunch of work with him. We did um, a lot of R&B. We, um, um, and just, this is the, kind of the way stuff works. I ended up playing it through this guy. We were hooked up with um, Babyface's wife's personal assistant was our buddy. See, what? Well, guess what? He got me a gig playing at Babyface's house when uh, Bill Clinton was the president at the time. He was giving a talk at the house. So once again, I, I had a killer budget on that. I hired a great band. We're over at Babyface's house set up. His, his grand <laughs> looked like this in his living room. So it was just, you know, one of those things all of a sudden. So the guy, the producer that I was doing a whole bunch of stuff with there, we did a bunch of rap stuff. I did stuff with a dog pound and um, it was awesome. I mean, and here's what I want to say too, man. We all are like in school here learning, you know, Bach and all this stuff. Man, those dudes take that seriously. So you don't go in and go, hey man, this is a bullshit gig for me because I know how to play Bach. It's, that's not, you can't have that attitude. You gotta go in and sort of get in the world that you're going to and like, you know, live it. Because here's the other thing, just because you can play Bach doesn't mean you're gonna be funky on a rap track, believe me. So you gotta get that side of your thing together too. So the producer who got me there, we spent a lot of time together and all of a sudden he, he uh, met a really nice woman and LA is not the greatest place to raise a family. So he moved to Atlanta to raise his family. I'm like, no, all that works, like screw it's over. You know, but I stayed in touch with him all of a sudden. He gave me a call and said, Shay, I've been working over at Red Zone Records where Tricky, Tricky Stewart is working. And uh, Tricky was doing Madonna at the time, Britney Spears. He did Raven Simone, so I did all those records. Now he's doing Rihanna. He's, he, Umbrella was his production of uh, Rihanna like three years ago, the record of the year. Blah, blah, blah. They flew me down to Atlanta. I recorded all that stuff down there. So I guess the point being is this came from this stupid little piece of paper hanging on the bullet board in, uh, at USC, almost like this sort of chunk throwaway gig at a, at a fish market near the beach. So I guess to that point, you all need to learn too, when you show up for anything, any gig, have it together. It's sort of, don't, don't be like, oh man, this is just a kind of crappy gig. I'm gonna bring a crappy attitude to it because you just don't know who else is on those gigs. Here's how I look at all of this now. Um, you know, you go to school, you learn all the reading technique, you get all that stuff down, and then a lot of music though, the popular music, jazz, rock, hip hop now, funk, was kind of created in the streets. So I really kind of see it, I kind of have this just vision in my head of having one foot up on the curb as I'm walking down the street, one foot up on the curb that's kind of the school side of things that I'm 
very proud of that I put the time in to do, and the other one down in the gutter. Because it really is like the, all the stuff I grew up like in the Black Sabbath, the Led Zeppelin, was all kind of that kind of music, this real just kind of gritty, bluesy, born on the streets kind of stuff. And I don't want to lose that part of me whatsoever just because I can play Bach now and I can play Giant Steps now. I, that stuff is why I picked up the guitar in the first place. And to me, you have to stick true to like what makes your kind of heart beat more when it comes on the radio. The studios are such that um, when you're in there, you're supposed to be an expert of that style. So there's no, and, and then this gets back to the foot up on the curb and one in the gutter. In LA, I was doing a lot of hip hop sessions for a while and uh, doing a lot of R&B sessions. And it's, that has nothing to do with like harmonic minor scales and the super Locrian scale and that you can do cool diminished licks. It's like, that doesn't mean anything. So, I mean, that stuff helps you technically on the guitar and all, but you have to kind of, um, I see people with the sort of superior attitude of, well, I do all that stuff, so this is kind of bullcrap. This is beneath me, and um, guess what? They don't get called back a lot for those sessions. So when you're in doing a hip-hop session, it might be the quote-unquote simple music to play. It's just not technically as demanding, but you need to sound extremely authentic, like you learned on the streets. When you're in the studio on like a, the Britney Spears stuff or like this hip-hop stuff, it's very specific kind of stuff you have to play on it, but also be creative within that smaller area. And you can't get away with sort of fudging that either. It sticks out right away. And that's almost like pop songs. First of all, no chromaticism, you know what I mean? So if you sort of, you know, in jazz, you sort of go to a wrong note, you slide into the next one. Pop sessions, that doesn't work. And, and uh, you know, you have to, sometimes I find them harder to do because you have to be sometimes a little more um, precise and the game has a lot more rules so you're you're it's a little tighter you have to be creative within a smaller arena I think so I've never sort of been in a session where you know the lights on and the, the tapes rolling or Pro Tools is rolling and it's just simple I'm, I'm, you're on high alert no matter what. You know, your brain has to be up on the highest level. I uh, see myself as almost a, um, uh, a patron of the arts for Shea Welsh. So I almost fund myself. So I do certain things in my career that put money in the bank for me. Um, and you know, some of the gigs I do are maybe not as artistically uh, 
pleasing to me or whatever, but I put them in a category and they keep your bank full with enough money that you can go sometimes. And here's, a, here's other gigs that don't pay money. Sometimes the coolest gigs just aren't the ones that pay a lot of money. So it's like, I don't categorize gigs by how much money they're making per se. So I like to take gigs sometimes that do make a lot of money, even if it's like maybe not the coolest thing. Then if there's gigs I really want to do that aren't paying a lot, I can go to them and really enjoy them. And I'm like, oh God, you know, we're so awesome, and, but we're only making 40 bucks, this sucks. And we can get into this whole discussion of cutting arts funds, and then people, you know, how the hell are they supposed to understand jazz if they haven't studied it in school? And, you know, we'll probably have to leave that for another day. But do you understand, I mean, you can't be mad at like the club owners in the music business because they're not paying you. I think some of this stuff is societal where people just don't understand jazz. They hear it and it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't really like that. And I think we all understand, like I was saying before, to understand difficult classical music and sort of heady jazz, you kind of have to study a little bit. You gotta immerse yourself in it so that you understand what's cool about it. It's hard, and, and I think it's one of those things, you're listening to Beethoven, it's really the cool to know about his life and to know he went deaf at the end of it. And then you hear a piece he wrote while he was deaf and you're like, whoa, man, that's amazing. You know, so it's, you kind of have to study it and understand it a little bit to get into it. So there's my, sort of my take on that. I'll tell you, there's sometimes too, as a band leader, I took many gigs and I still do it where I don't make any money, but I make sure I pay the band so that they are happy to show up and do it. And uh, you know, I try to leverage that and make sure it's a cool gig and all. I don't do that just willy-nilly, but sometimes as a businessman, everything a business does doesn't necessarily make money. You, so sometimes you lose money on over here, but then you just you make it in another way because you were able to, on that gig, be seen by somebody who can help you whatever get into the studios later on. I have invested quite a bit in my equipment. Um, you know, I have a really intricate pedal board, and a lot of the sessions I do in LA, you know, you'll get in there and uh, you'll get this, hey, can you do that sound that I, that's on like, whatever, this, my, this record, this new record with, um, you know, the strokes, that sound. You know what I'm talking about in that hit? And, and I'll go, yeah, 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 is it this? And I'll step on like the purple one and give them the, Give them that sound, you know. So you have to kind of, if you're going to do the studios in LA, you have to have a big palette of sounds. And and it is sort of the thing. All my guitars, I have no excuses anymore. I can't blame it on my equipment because the equipment's all great. So if something's going wrong, it's me. So it's 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 that kind of uh, accountability. You know, I guess I'm getting ready to wrap up. So there's part of. Um, you know, obviously, keep talking all your. You guys have an amazing faculty, you know. There, it always has been at this school, but it's pretty amazing what your resources are here to get the good stuff and to, you know, ask the questions about how to get out and gig and all that stuff. Um, but one big thing I said this morning is be accountable to yourself. And I think a big thing that I've done is I'm not afraid to confront my weaknesses on the guitar and go after them. I think sometimes people don't want to deal with that. And um, if you do that, just be real open about it. It's like having taught a lot of people now, I have never had a complete guitar player come to me where they have everything, a killer ear, great technique, um, can read, that it just, doesn't generally all end up in one package. Every once in a while it does, but uh, generally not. So we'll hone in when that student comes or whatever on their weaknesses. It's like, okay, your ear's cool. Let's just leave that as a given. We can work on that later, but you need to work on your technique now, or your technique's great, your ear's great. Let's work on your, um, you know, your improvisational skills, just being able to open up. So there's something that's a weakness 
that you guys just, just confront it and work on it. It's cool. Because when you try to, you know, not deal with it or whatever, it comes out and bites your ass, like when you're up on the stage in front of people. It just does. And in a place like LA, if you go out there and you're shy, I, I'm just going to tell you, don't go out there if you're going to be shy about it. You have to get your trumpet out and blow it and let people know you're there and that you're good. And you, it's like one of those things you just have to. And I think everybody, all the guys who have broken through and are successful, at some point you have to learn how to advocate for yourself and get out and uh, let people know that you play and that you're good. All right, I guess that's probably about what we have time for. I'm going to hang out for a few minutes if you guys have any more questions. But thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you all tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Around